Hello, I am Darren Fearon. I am one of the beamline scientists on the XChem Fragment Screening Platform at Diamond Light Source. Today I will be talking to you about our work on crystallographic fragment screening with SARS-CoV-2 main protease and crowdsourcing the development of antiviral drugs. Today we'll start off by giving you a brief introduction to the facilities at Diamond Light Source. I will then introduce fragment screening and the capabilities of the XChem Fragment Screening Platform. I will share some of the work we have been doing over the past 12 months on various COVID-19 targets before focusing more specifically on the massive main protease screen and subsequent moonshot collaboration to develop a new antiviral. Finally, I will finish up by sharing some details about where XCHEM is going next. Diamond is the UK's national synchrotron and is based on the Harwell Research and Innovation Campus, just south of Oxford. It works like a giant microscope. By accelerating electrons to near light speeds so they give off intense light, 10 billion times brighter than the sun. These intense beams of light are then directed off into the laboratories, known as beamlines. Here, scientists use the light to study a vast range of subject matter, from new medicines and treatments for disease, to innovative engineering and cutting edge technology. Diamond Light Source is a not-for-profit limited company funded as a joint venture between UK Research and Innovation and the Wellcome Trust. Over 14,000 researchers from across life and physical sciences, both from academia and industry, use Diamond to conduct experiments, assisted by approximately 700 members of staff. Pharmaceutical companies and academic researchers are making increasing use of macromolecular crystallography to study proteins involved in health and disease. Improvements in the speed of data collection and in the solving of structures mean that it is now possible to obtain structural information on the time scale that allows medicinal and computational chemists to work together with structural biologists and the development of promising compounds into drug candidates. Here at Diamond Light Source, we have seven macromolecular beamlines, including specialized beamlines for microfocus, long wavelength, in situ, and submicron data collection. Alongside the MX beamlines, we have further dedicated facilities for X-ray for the electron lasers, cryo-electron microscopy, circular dichroism, small angle X-ray scattering, X-ray microscopy and infrared spectroscopy, and finally us, the XCHEM fragment screening platform, which is associated with the high throughput, highly automated beamline IO41. So what is the XCHEM fragment screening platform? To explain that, I will briefly introduce the principles of fragment-based drug discovery. For traditional high throughput screening, large libraries of lead-like molecules, typically 300 Daltons or larger, are screened in biochemical or cellular assays in the hope of identifying promising compounds for further optimization. The advantage of HCS is that it usually identifies potent compounds, but challenging targets can have very low hit rates and HCS hits can be difficult to optimise, often making use of structural biology to do so. In comparison, fragment-based drug discovery screens smaller libraries with compounds that are lower molecular weight, typically 250 Daltons or smaller, with the aim of identifying weak but efficient compounds which bind to the protein of interest. As there are fewer possible compounds that can be synthesised with fewer atoms, we were able to sample a greater area of possible chemical space with smaller libraries. As fragment hits are weak but efficient, sensitive methods are required to detect binding, typically using biophysical techniques such as NMR and SVR. However, for fragment-based drug discovery projects, it is highly advantageous to have structural input from X-ray crystallography to validate these hits and to drive optimization from fragments into lead-like molecules. Fragment hits can be developed in three different ways to develop more potent lead-like compounds. They can be grown to fill previously unoccupied space. If two or more fragments bind in close proximity, these can then be linked. Or if two or more fragments overlap in binding poses and have some common features, they can be merged together to give a single compound. Fragment screening using biophysical techniques such as NMR and SBR is now a well-established method for identifying lead-like compounds. They are usually medium to high throughput methods and have greater sensitivity in comparison to biochemical assays. 
Historically, X-ray fragment screening using traditional soaking methods was tedious, low throughput and time consuming. However, thanks to advances in synchrotron capabilities and the introduction of streamlined crystal soaking systems such as the x platform, this has led to substantial improvements in throughput and integration between crystal soaking, data collection and HIT identification. Advantages of crystallographic fragment screening are that it is highly sensitive, more so than NMR or SBR. It allows identification of even very weak but efficient HITs, and it provides immediate structural information for follow-up. Although it is a static system, some structural flexibility can be observed depending on the target and crystal system. This method does require a robust and soakable crystal system, i.e. a crystal system that diffracts well, typically to below 2.5 angstrom resolution, tolerates solvents and has an accessible site of interest. The XChem Fragment Screening Platform at Diamond has been available to users since April 2015. Set up and managed by Frank von Delft, who joined Diamond in 2013, the platform has made massive strides in streamlining high throughput crystal soaking and providing these facilities to academic and industrial users. In crystal fragment screening can now be achieved an order of magnitude faster than prior to the development of the platform. For a typical project, crystal growth, sample preparation, data collection and data processing with up to 1000 crystals can be achieved in a week, with capacity for two to three users per week. In the first three years of operation, XChem collected data for 150,000 crystals, identifying over 3000 fragment hits for more than 150 drug discovery targets from academic and industrial users, but also from in-house research. Owing to the success of XChem, similar platforms are currently being established at five synchrotrons worldwide, including Bessie in Germany, Max4 in Sweden, and Spring8 in Japan. This figure highlights the impact that XChem has had on the throughput of crystallographic fragment screening. Using traditional crystal soaking techniques, the time required to complete an experiment that was of comparable scale to what is achievable in a single week at XChem would take approximately three months. The XChem platform is enabled by various unique technological advances. They each on their own would not necessarily be revolutionary, but combined deliver a platform greater than the sum of its parts. The process is divided into three key areas. Sample preparation using various new technologies, including acoustic liquid dispensing and robot assisted crystal harvesting. Unattended data collection with highly reliable processing pipelines for automated data analysis and data analysis using novel algorithms to rapidly identify outliers in the data that correspond to binding events. These three areas are all connected with data being recorded in a central database, allowing the user to focus on one particular step of the experiment at a time. For sample preparation, we have a dedicated lab, Lab 34, on the periphery of the ring at Diamond, immediately adjacent to the Beamline I-041. The lab contains all the necessary equipment, tools and logistical support required for rapidly preparing thousands of samples from crystal trays which have been previously imaged using the Formulatrix crystal imagers and our neighbouring facility, the research complex at Harwell. With two to three groups of users typically on site every week, the lab can look very busy. However, we are currently operating with limited access in a COVID secure manner. The first step following imaging of crystal trays is the identification of drops which contain crystals. As compound solutions are added directly to the crystal drop, the number of drops containing crystals is often the limiting factor in users' experiments. We manually inspect every crystal drop, selecting those with high quality crystals to be used for soaking and indicate the coordinates for dispensing compound solutions. More on this to come later. Next, we use a highly accurate and precise acoustic dispensing robot called an ECHO, which dispenses the compound solutions from a stock plate directly into the crystallization drops of an inverted crystallization plate. Although in our experience, crystals are more tolerant to this soaking method than manual transfer to a new drop, it is advised to avoid targeting the dispense directly onto the crystals to avoid high local concentrations of solvent and compounds, which may destroy the crystals. Using the ECHO, we can transfer hundreds of compounds into crystallization drops in a matter of minutes, with volumes as small as 2.5 nanoliters. 
using manual methods this process would take days if not weeks and be much more prone to human error. Cryoprotectants can also be added to crystallisation drops using this instrument. Once crystals have been soaked with compounds for the desired length of time, usually hours or overnight, we then need to harvest all of our crystals. To do this we use the crystal shifter. This is an automated XY platform that stores crystal trays in a sealed environment, allowing users to mount from a single drop at a time. This instrument speeds up by several orders of magnitude the mind-numbing chore of picking out hundreds of crystals, with experienced users regularly mounting 200 crystals in a single error for well-behaved crystal systems. The shifter has dedicated software which records the outcome of the mounting experiment, mounted, failed, compound precipitation, crystal cracking, etc. It also records puck location and soak time and stores information in our central database before moving the platform to the plate location required to mount the next sample. The lab has sufficient pucks, pins, cryo tools and jurors for storing several thousands of crystals until data collection. Following preparation of the samples, unattended data collection is carried out using our high throughput fixed wavelength beamline, IO41. Samples can be centered automatically, either using optical methods if the samples are large, chunky crystals, or by screening for X-ray diffraction across a grid covering the sample area. We have demonstrated that for high resolution and high symmetry crystal systems, data collection times of 15 seconds are suitable for the identification of fragments. Therefore, depending on the method selected and the crystal system, data can be collected for between 20 and 30 samples in a single hour. With dual capacity for 592 samples, the beamline is capable of running for nearly 20 hours without manual intervention, and data collection for a typical screen of our in-house DSI POIS library, which contains 768 compounds, can be completed in a little over 24 hours. This is far more efficient than even highly experienced synchrotron users. Once data collection is complete, data can be analysed using our well-established workflow for hit identification, structure refinement and deposition. Central to this process is a piece of software called XChem Explorer, or XCE for short, which was developed by Tobias Croger, previously the SUC in Oxford, but now based at Fragmax in Lund. XCE is a graphical user interface that can retrieve auto-processing results from our data collection and write this information to the corresponding sample in our sample database. XCE is also capable of launching multiple molecular replacement, restraint generation or refinement jobs in parallel, speeding up the analysis workflow. It can also be used to run and analyse results from our hit identification software, Panda, which I will discuss shortly. Finally, XCE can be used to group files together for PDB deposition, allowing a large number of structures to be deposited in a single entry. In macromolecular crystallography, the detection of change states, such as ligand binding events, is difficult unless a strong signal is observed. Unfortunately, ambiguous or noisy density is common, since molecular states are generally only fractionally present in the crystal. In order to identify clear electron density for the change state or the ligand bound state, even from noisy maps, we developed the PANDA algorithm. PANDA takes advantage of a large number of datasets produced by an XCHEM experiment that do not contain a ligand binding event to prepare an average map known as a ground state. By subtracting the ground state from the experimental maps, change states or ligand binding events are objectively identified from statistical analysis of density distributions. While XEE can also be used to streamline the process of depositing all structures generated by an XCHEM experiment to the PDB, a platform has not previously existed that allowed all of this data to be displayed collectively, allowing snapshots of interesting interactions or collections of hits to be shared easily with collaborators. In order to improve dissemination of XCHEM data, we created the web app Vergalsis. Beyond displaying and sharing data from an XCHEM experiment, Fergalysis can reduce lists of related compounds to purchase from chemical suppliers and allow allows the upload of computational models to aid the design of improved compounds. Since founding the platform in 2015, the response from both academic and industrial users has been huge, with the platform now regularly oversubscribed. Following a steady increase in uptake in the first three years, Diamond invested heavily in training, restructuring and stabilising capacity in 2018, creating a dedicated XCHEM team 
with Alice and myself responsible for training, supporting, and providing technical expertise to academic users, and Alice and Elsa providing the same service to industrial users. We also have two members of staff, Josie and Louise, who are dedicated to Beamline support. Despite users not being able to access the site for 10 months of 2020 and having to operate within coronavirus operational restrictions, including reduced beam time, the XCAM team managed to reduce a highly respectable amount of data for several user projects and multiple COVID-19 drug discovery targets, which will now be the focus of the next section of my seminar. Coronaviruses are a family of viruses, which includes the common cold, SARS, MERS, and the current cause of the outbreak of COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. There have been over 124 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 worldwide, resulting in nearly 3 million deaths. Several vaccines have been developed and approved in a phenomenal amount of time, but due to the difficulties of global vaccination, the emergence of resistant strains, and the subsets of the population for whom a vaccine is not suitable, antivirals still have a role to play. Despite previous zoonotic outbreaks worldwide, no antiviral drugs have been developed for coronaviruses, suggesting other methods for identifying these valuable therapeutics is required. When the pandemic first struck, Diamond rapidly shifted its focus towards the coronavirus, ensuring that it was doing everything possible to support researchers in their efforts to discover more about this global challenge. There has been some fantastic work carried out that involved the identification of new antibodies and nanobodies, which you can read about in these publications, and also work on the repurposing of clinically approved drugs, which unfortunately has so far proved unsuccessful. Today I'm going to focus more on the development of new antiviral drugs using a fragment-based approach. During the last 12 months, the XCHEM team at Diamond Light Source have worked on eight distinct SARS-CoV-2 proteins. On this slide, we have a representation of the polyprotein, which is encoded by the SARS-CoV-2 genome. This is cleaved by two cysteine proteases, PLPRO and MPRO, to give the proteins which are essential to the spread of the virus and its disease symptoms. The 3D structure of the proteins which have been screened using the XGEN platform are also highlighted. The first target the XGEN team worked on was the main protease, this is one of two cysteine proteases in SARS-CoV-2, and it is essential for viral replication and is highly conserved in all coronaviruses. To identify starting points for inhibitors of this enzyme, we performed a large-scale screen of electrophilic and non-covalent fragments through a combined mass spec and X-ray approach, identifying 71 hits that spanned the entire active site, as well as three hits at the dimer interface. These structures revealed routes to rapidly develop more potent inhibitors for the emerging of covalent and non-covalent fragment hits, which I will discuss in more detail later. The initial structures were made publicly available within four weeks of receiving the gene constructs. The next target we screened is the NSP3 macrodomain, or MAC1 for short. The macrodomain is a structural module conserved in all kingdoms of life. It reverses host-derived ADP ribosylation an innate immune response mediated by PARP enzymes. Macrodomain deficient viruses are unable to replicate in human cells. This work started out as a collaboration with Myron Schuller and Ivan Ahel at the Sir William Dunn School of Pathology at the University of Oxford. But after discovering that our colleagues, James Fraser and Brian Shoshet at the University of California, San Francisco were also working on this target, we combined efforts to complete a massive screen that was described as a tour de force by Dan Erlinson at Practical Fragments. The third target we screened was the non-structural protein 15, or NENDO-U. This is an endonuclease which forms a large hexameric complex and is involved in processing single and double-strand RNA, hiding it from the host defense system, making it likely responsible for the viral evasion mechanism of SARS-CoV-2, but its exact role is not yet known. This project is an ongoing collaboration between ourselves and the Godoy Group at the University of Sao Paulo. Next, we have the nucleocapsid protein, or NPRO. This protein is involved in the packaging of the RNA genome, regulating viral RNA synthesis during replication and transcription, and modulating metabolism in infected subjects. This work was done in collaboration with Leo James and Jacob Luptak at the University of Cambridge, who are actively progressing the development of directed warheads for protax targeting this protein. 
non-structural protein 13, or NSP13, is a helicase that has been identified as a possible target for antiviral drugs due to its high sequence conservation and essential role in viral replication. In collaboration with Joe Newman and Ofer Gileadi at the Centre for Medicine's Discovery in Oxford, we identified more than 50 fragments bound to the RNA or nucleotide binding site, and these are currently being followed up by ourselves and in partnership with industrial collaborators. The penultimate screen we completed was against the papain-like protease, or PLPRO. This is the second essential cysteine protease belonging to SARS-CoV-2 and is again involved in viral replication. Analysis of this project is still ongoing, but more than 60 hits have been identified that span across the entire protein, with some hits being identified close to the catalytic active site. This project has been led by Martin Walsh at Diamond. Finally, the most recent screen we completed was against the complex of non-structural proteins 16 and 10, or NSP1610. This complex plays an important role in RNA stability and protein translation. Data collection for this screen was completed in early March, and analysis is still currently ongoing, although several promising hits have already been identified. In the illustrated protein structure, each small blue ball represents a potential hit, with the larger numbered balls representing sites of interest on the protein target. Again, this work was done in collaboration with colleagues at the Centre for Medicine's Discovery at Oxford University. To summarise, eight COVID-19 targets were analysed using the XCAM platform, seven of which are either complete or undergoing analysis, with one project, RBD, proving unsuitable for the platform due to poorly diffracting crystals. This has resulted in more than 12,000 datasets for COVID-19 projects, with more than 400 hits already identified all of which has been, or will be made, publicly available to help drive research against the coronavirus. Several international collaborations have been established due to the rapid rate at which this work is carried out, but more importantly by the willingness to make the data publicly available for use by the wider scientific community. One of these collaborations, the COVID Moonshot, will be the focus of the next session of this seminar. As I mentioned earlier, the main protease, or MPRO, is one of two cysteine proteases encoded by the SARS-CoV-2 genome, and it is responsible for polyprotein processing, making it essential for viral replication. It is highly conserved in all other coronaviruses, such as SARS and MERS, making it an attractive pan-coronavirus drug target. Currently, there are no approved inhibitors for MPRO for any human coronaviruses, although Pfizer have begun clinical trials for an oral inhibitor in the last few weeks. The active form of MPRO is a homodimer, and I've just highlighted here the catalytic dyad of cysteine-145 and histidine-41. We have mainly focused on targeting this active site, although other groups have investigated the possibility of disrupting the protein dimer. The first structure of MPRO from SARS-CoV-2 was released by the Rare Group in Shanghai towards the end of January in 2020. Diamond started working on this target in early February, which actually coincided with my first few days working at Diamond, so I think it's fair to say I was flown in at the deep end. The protein production and initial crystallization was carried out by Martin Walsh's group at Diamond, with the first crystal hits being identified by the 20th of February. Within six weeks, we had released the entire results from our screen. The pace of this work would a lot to the convergence of various technologies, such as an updated version of Panda and Fregalsis, plus new screening libraries being made available for use by our collaborators. Several hits came from a covalent library of chloroacetamides provided by our collaborator near London at the Weizmann Institute in Israel. A more common method for identifying covalent inhibitors is to take an advanced inhibitor and add a covalent warhead, but Nier and his team screened this library by mass spec alongside our crystallographic screen, and we saw a good correlation with compounds that showed high levels of labelling in mass spec and those we were able to model in our crystal structures. While we identified fragments binding at a wide range of sites across the protein, 
including in the dimer interface, it became immediately apparent that we had very good levels of coverage across the active site. For MPRO, the active site can be further divided into subsites based on the peptide substrate binding, and we identified fragments which bound in the four characterized subsites. We also noticed some common features for fragments bound in each of these sites. In S1, which is shown in the bottom right in yellow, we frequently identified fragments which contained an aromatic nitrogen, which could hydrogen bond with histidine 163, and either an amide or urea, which was hydrogen bonding to the backbone of glutamic acid 166 through the carbonyl group. The S2 pocket, which is shown in the top left in green, was reported to have much more plasticity and less specificity for its peptide substrate. In this region, we often observed aromatic fragments, which can pie stack with the histidine 41, and these often contained a substituent such as a halogen or nitrile group, which could poke into a small hydrophobic pocket at the back of this site. In the S3 site, shown in the bottom left in blue, we often observed sulfones or sulfonamides, which could introduce a possible vector to explore further out into S4. And finally, in S1 prime, we usually observed more lipophilic groups, which made few specific or directional interactions, adding further grease to this pocket. Once we had completed our screen and solved all of our structures, we were keen to release them into the wild as quickly as possible to help inspire and drive drug discovery projects against this target. As well as depositing the PDB, we published a blog post on the Diamond website with details of the entire screening experiment. We made raw data available in Zenodo, we made all of our models available to view and download on Fricalysis, and we published a preprint and bioarchive ahead of later publishing in NatureComs. We also took to social media. And this series of tweets from Martin Walsh describing our experiment and the results caught the eye of the guys at Postera, Alpha Lee, Aaron Morris, and Matt Robinson. Postera is an AI platform that integrates molecular design with chemical synthesis using machine learning. The Postera team offered to build a web portal where anyone in the world could submit a compound design based on our fragment screen results that we could then synthesize and evaluate as inhibitors. And this is how the COVID moonshot was born. The ambition of the moonshot was to tap into the worldwide pool of human creativity and technology to discover a preclinical generic drug targeting Emperor within 12 months. It turned out that a lot of people shared this ambition with us, leading to a large global collaboration. With medicinal chemistry designs coming from across the world using the post era platform, the evaluation of designs was carried out in the Codera Group at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre in the US, plus UCB Pharma and Med Chemical Consultants in the UK. The synthesis was carried out using contract research organisations, mainly Enamine in the Ukraine, with activity testing being done both at the Wiseman Institute in Israel and in the Chris Schofield Group at the University of Oxford, while Diamond continued to provide protein supply and structural support. To summarise, we had more than 30 groups across the world offering IP and expertise, pro bono, with experiments being done at cost using philanthropic funding. The first step to achieving our ambitious target was the collating of ideas from across the global community. The post era portal allowed users to simply draw in their proposed designs and provide contact details. They could also provide rationale for the suggestions they had made and computational models were available to help with prioritization. Once again, we took to Twitter to help broadcast this platform. And what we received was a truly overwhelming response. With over 7,000 diverse designs submitted by over 350 contributors. From synthesizing and testing the first 800 compounds, we were able to rapidly identify some hits in the submicromolar range. As I mentioned previously, the activity of these compounds is being tested at the Wiseman Institute and at the University of Oxford using two different orthogonal biochemical assays. At the Wiseman Institute, we had a threat-based fluorescence assay, 
the measured cleavage of the peptide substrate. And at the University of Oxford, we had a rapid fire mass spec based assay that measured both the depletion of the peptide substrate and production of the cleaved peptides. By comparing the initial results from both assay formats, we could see that we had a good correlation in IC50 values. In general, the reported IC50 values were slightly better for the rapid fire assay than in the fluorescence assay, but this was likely due to differences in our assay conditions. We also observed the presence of several outliers that can be seen along the X and Y axis, and these point to compounds which were very active in one assay, but completely inactive in the other, indicating that these were interfering with one assay in some way. I'll now spend a bit of time discussing some of the compound series that we identified in a little bit more detail. One series that spawned from the covalent screen I discussed earlier was the chloroacetamide series. A covalent inhibitor of Empro is highly appealing as there is an obvious cysteine residue to target and covalent inhibitors can provide strong target affinity and prolonged activity in patients. By merging the initial chloroacetamide hits with non-covalent fragments from the S2 and S3 sites, we were able to identify inhibitors with IC50 values of around 500 nanomolar. One example being this submission from Dave Briggs at the Crick Institute in London. However, despite this compound series looking attractive in both assay formats, demonstrating good labeling in protein observed mass spec, and having several crystal structures available to help drive the design, it became apparent that they displayed reasonable levels of cytotoxicity, potentially due to being non-specific and the high reactivity of the chloroacetamide warhead. Therefore, it became apparent that if we wanted to develop a covalent inhibitor of Empro, we would need the affinity of the compound to be driven first by molecular recognition rather than the reactivity of the chemical warhead. A second covalent series was identified by some other work from near London's group. We refer to this series as the Yugi series based on the chemistry used for their synthesis. By taking a reported non-covalent inhibitor of SARS, shown in green in panel A, their algorithm identified that substituting the furan with an acrylamide moiety, you could produce a covalent inhibitor. The docking pose of this compound is shown in magenta in panel A. Gratifyingly, after synthesizing this compound and solving the crystal structure, we were able to confirm that the predicted binding pose was pretty accurate with the X-ray structure shown in cyan in panel B. Some rapid exploration of the SAR of this series identified various covalent inhibitors, several of which we were able to obtain these crystal structures for, and these are shown overlaying in panel C. One of the most promising covalent UK inhibitors was this low micromolar compound shown here. This included a fluorobenzyl substituent, which explored S4. It also contained an aromatic nitrogen in this pyridine ring bound in S1, which is in line with what we earlier reported with our fragment screen. As well as displaying good inhibitory activity, we could confirm that this series was covalently modifying the protein using protein observed mass spec. However, this series does possess some problems with metabolism and it would require an increase in activity of a few orders of magnitude before we would consider it as a promising series to develop a drug. The next series of compounds I want to tell you about is a quinolone series. This submission was based on a series of micromolar inhibitors from the previous SARS virus. These compounds were readily available at enamine, so we were rapidly able to identify that they also possess micromolar activity against the SARS-CoV-2 Empro. This figure presented on this slide just highlights where the activity of these compounds sits overall in terms of our initial results. You can see that these aren't the most potent of our compounds, but they do give us a consistent series with some SAR starting to emerge. Limited exploration of the SAR of this series rapidly identified some submicromolar inhibitors such as this compound here. We have been able to solve the crystal structures of multiple examples of this series bound to SARS-CoV-2 Empro. 
We found that the quinoline amide mimicked the glutamine substrate binding, which is present in the S1 site of Empro, forming interactions with histidine 163 and glutamic acid 166. An aromatic substituent also occupied the S2 site, as is often observed in our fragment screen. But it was obvious from these structures that there was good opportunity to explore further the S4 and S1 prime sites using this series and another round of design. The next series we identified was the benzotriazole series, again based on reported micromolar inhibitors of SARS Empro. In this case, the benzotriazole group was predicted to form interactions with histidine 163 in the S1 site, and various substituents were exploring the S1 prime, S2, and S4 sites, although these appear to be suboptimal in the original compound based on the crystal structure from 4MDS. Screening these submitted designs against the SARS-CoV-2 Empro also showed that they possess micromolar activity against our homologue, the best of which was 1.63 micromolar, demonstrated by the compound highlighted in yellow in the bottom right of the screen. As before, rapid optimization led to submicromolar inhibitors for this series. The best inhibitor displayed IC50 values below 500 nanomolar in both of our assay formats. As expected from the previously obtained crystal structures, the benzotriazole core was sitting in the S1 site, forming the key interaction with the histine residue there. The chlorobenzyl group is sat in S2, although the chlorosubstituent is pointing towards S4 and not the small hydrophobic pocket at the back of S2, as we may have expected. We also had the dimethyl amino phenyl group exploring the S1 prime, although this looks like a good candidate for further optimization. The final series I would like to highlight is the amino pyridine series, which rapidly became the series we have focused most heavily on in the COVID moonshot. This series originated from merging various fragment hits, with this submission from Trifons Organis at the University of Oxford really kicking it off. While none of these fragments displayed decent levels of activity alone in either the rapid fire or SBR assays, by adding the methyl group to the amino pyridine in S1, and the chlorosubstituent to the aromatic ring in S2, we were able to get good levels of activity in a single step. The activity of this merged compound was in the tens of micromolar for both assay formats, and the crystal structure revealed that the binding pose was largely as expected, with the key interactions with histidine 163 and glutamic acid 166 maintained, and the chlorosubstituent was exploring the cavity at the back of S2, as we hoped. The crystal structure here also highlights the capacity to further develop this series into the S1 prime sites and the S4 site. At this point, we felt we had three really promising leads to take forward, the aminopyridines, the benzotriazoles, and the quinolones. In the interest of time, I'm going to focus on the optimization of the aminopyridines. Our strategy was to enumerate a series of these compounds, including input from medicinal chemists and the wider community, and then prioritize these using three energy calculations, synthesize and test, making the data available and repeat the process. On this slide, I've highlighted the initial exploration strategies we had for this series, which revealed several things. At the top of this slide, I've included the reference compound for comparison. We found that substitution of the chloratom was not well tolerated, even by things that we had observed previously in this position in our fragment screen. The best result we obtained was substitution with a nitrile group, which resulted in over a twofold loss in activity. When exploring the S4 pocket using vectors that were available on the chlorobenzyl group, the best substitution we identified was this lactam. However, this group was highly metabolized, so not an optimal substitution for a drug molecule. When exploring the S1 prime site, we observed things previously in line with the, the fragment screen we carried out, and that greasy groups that formed minimal and specific interactions gave the best results in the biochemical assays, 
but also reduce the drug-like properties of our compound, such as the C log P, resulting in increased toxicity and reduced solubility. Finally, we identified that substitution of the methylpyridine group with bulkier aromatic systems, such as the isoquinoline, gave an improvement in the biochemical activity in two orders of magnitude. Based on this result, the aminopyridine series rapidly morphed into the isoquinoline series that were able to progress quite rapidly using a structure-based approach into compounds such as this bicyclic analogue shown here, which picks up additional interactions from glutamine 189. This compound has a low nanomolar activity in our biochemical assays, but more excitingly, it actually demonstrates good levels of activity in cellular assays as well, with an IC50 and Vero E6 cells of 1.57 micromolar. And just to highlight the progress made of this series, for one of our most advanced compounds, you can actually observe a dose-dependent reduction in viral particles in a plaque assay and it is more effective than remdesivir, which is currently approved for COVID patients that require hospitalisation. The example shown here is also actually the South African SARS-CoV-2 mutant strain. Where are we now? From the initial fragment data, which was released in April last year, we have progressed through HIT lead development, having identified three promising lead series and reaching 50 nanomolar enzyme inhibition and good cellular antiviral activity. Our current lead series, the isoquinolines, has been shown to inhibit new strains of the SARS-CoV-2, plus it has good selectivity and an excellent safety profile. However, we still have some challenges to improve the physical chemical properties of this series, such as the solubility. We also have to improve the oral exposure and the metabolic stability before we can nominate a clinical candidate. Our work on EMPRO has been dependent on the contribution of many people from all over the world, some of who are highlighted here. To finish off, I just want to touch on how the XChem platform is developing and what you can expect to see from us next. In 2020, XChem and IO41 demonstrated its world-leading position at the interface of synchrotron radiation and fragment-based drug discovery. With the development of a new era of synchrotrons, Diamond is soon to be upgraded to Diamond 2, which will require IO41 to be retired in its current location. This has provided us the opportunity to build a new beamline, KO4, with higher flux and optimised for speed, even with small crystals, this will increase the throughput of XChem tenfold. This new beamline has the potential to be the hit finding engine for academic and industrial users allowing these sectors to accelerate hit to lead progression. It will also allow us to explore currently inconceivable targets, such as membrane proteins and large protein complexes. We will be able to exploit the interface of machine learning and artificial intelligence and drug design with automation and chemical synthesis. And we will also be able to target new modalities, such as allosteric inhibitors or protax. Progressing fragment screen results to potency in a fast and low-cost manner still remains a major challenge. In our experience, fragment merging can lead to results faster than growing or linking, but currently no algorithms exist for enumerating and ranking merges. Based on this experience, we are currently developing new algorithms to help guide our merging processes. Finally, we are developing methods for chemist-assisted robotics using machine learning and retrosynthetic algorithms to help automate our chemistry, with the aim to reduce the cost, time and manpower required to make the next round of compounds based on our fragment hits. Tony from our group has also recently published some work that highlights how it is possible to screen crude reaction mixtures using X-ray crystallography by letting the protein prolate the active species. This means we can bypass purification. To finish off, I would just like to acknowledge my various colleagues who contributed massively to the work I have shown you in this seminar. The development of the XChem platform has been driven by the XChem and IO41 teams at Diamond Light Source. We have also been helped by Frank Wendell's PX group of his Centre for Medicine Discovery at the University of Oxford and a huge number of external collaborators.